says that. And that has become almost prayer changes everything. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's turn to page 169. Let my life be a light. That ought to be everyone's prayer this morning Amen. is that our life is a light to someone. Because you know that's what God created us for. Not only just to praise and worship Him, but to be a light to others.
every heart, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. I just worship you this morning. Glory to your name. And Lord, I just thank you, Jesus, for moving in this place. Hallelujah. You know, we used to sing a song when I was a little girl in the growing up in the Pentecostal church, and it just said, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. And you know, that's what we want this morning. We want to welcome you into this sanctuary. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit.
Praise the Lord. I used to think of 20 songs in a row. I can't think of them anymore.
May we worship God forever. And if this is true that I can be face to feet. Pray for me. We fly many people who can't understand why we are so happy and
the Lord. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, I'm not forgetting prayer requests. We're holding them to the, uh, to the end here. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn into the book of Luke in the 18th chapter. The Sunday school classes uh, can be dismissed. Victoria's got a good lesson downstairs, and she's got lots of prizes and, and all kinds of things like that. I've seen kazoos, and I've seen snakes that expand in water and, and all kinds of other things that we can't talk about, all, all, all sorts of, uh, of goodness and wonderfulness. We're going to find little kids running around with snakes, and John's going to be telling everybody that they handle snakes at his church. <laughs> you know that the only state that's legal in is West Virginia. I know there's a bunch of others that do that. I give your Bibles, turn into the book of Luke in the 18th chapter, everybody, 18th chapter of Luke. We've been talking a lot about prayer here lately. I really feel it in my heart here that, uh, that we need to focus more on prayer as a church, as Christians. We need to focus more on fasting and as Christians. Uh, I've heard it said that a man without, pr uh, without prayer, a Christian without prayer is the same thing as a man if you took the breath out of him. A church without prayer is the same thing as if you took a prayer person and you took the breath out of them because they don't stand and they don't have a foundation to stand on. We talk so much about prayer. We've been talking about how in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, how Jesus said when you pray to pray like this. When you begin to talk about the power of prayer, when you begin to talk about when you fast, you need to fast like this. Not as the Pharisees do, but they'll have their reward. But he said those things that you do in secret that the Lord will reward you for openly. Here in the book of Luke in the 18th chapter, it starts off, it kicks into it right away. Verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Hallelujah. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you would work and that you would just continue to move in a glorious way in the service that we would feel your presence, Lord, resonating around us, Lord, Father. We pray, God, that you would just work, God, in our lives and in our prayer lives, Lord. Those things that we're so needful of, that we've cried out, that we've made a petition before you your throne like the New Testament talks about God that we made a petition before you God for we pray Lord that you would just hear those prayers that you would meet our needs as we cry out to you in Jesus mighty name amen the Bible here Jesus begins to tell a parable and before it starts we see that the word of God begins and it says that he spoke a parable unto them to this end this is what it was all about this is what the what the message was this was the purpose if you get nothing else out of this message Focus on these words that we ought to pray, always pray, not half the time, not some of the time, not just when we're in trouble, but, but even more so, right? But we ought always to pray and not to faint, not to grow weary. The Bible talks about in the last days, one of the most sad, disparaging things that happens is it says that men's hearts will become cold, and because of that, many of them will faint, many of them will fall that they should be because something inside of them has grown stale. It's a love grown stale. There's a, uh, a secular song and it's called Hallelujah. And it begins talking about David and it talks uh, about all kinds of kind of sort of biblical stuff and it sounds down and it sounds disparaging. And the writer of that song, I think the original one's like 80 some verses long. I kind of read through some of it. It makes no sense. But the, uh, the writer that says that the song is about a love that has grown stale, a love that's grown stale, that's grown, that's went backwards, that's went in reverse uh, because it grows cold and it grows stale. The Bible says that we're always to pray and not to faint. Here in this parable that it's talking about, it goes right into it. If you've got a red letter Bible, you'll see that the words turn red right after that point. It begins to go into it, and it says that there was in a city, there was a judge that didn't fear the Lord. This guy wasn't a just man. This guy wasn't a good Christian man. This man wasn't a man with a, with a religious faith or with a foundation in God. It didn't matter to him what was right or what was wrong. He didn't really have that kind of reverence for these sort of things. But yet he was made an authority figure. He was made a judge. It sounds a lot like the courts today. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them like the courts today, doesn't it? You have somebody in that's a judge. Maybe their thinking's not right on things. Maybe they don't stand for the people that they're supposed to represent. Maybe they can just care less. 
as long as he's living a comfortable life and didn't seem to bother him whether it was right or wrong, whether thou shalt not or go ahead and do it. Uh, he didn't care and it didn't matter to him. The Bible said that he had no fear of God. The only thing that we see that concerned this man in this entire scripture is if something was personally affecting him, this man, this judge that was here. But we see that there was a woman that came to him. The Bible says in verse 3, there was a widow in the city and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. She had a great need. She had some big thing going on, didn't she? This wasn't some kind of a small thing. This wasn't some sort of an insignificant thing. This wasn't a sort of thing that she could just get up and do herself, John, that she could make happen that she could just set into effect. But she said, I have a problem. I have an enemy. I have a situation. And judge, I need you to deal with it. You have the power and you have the ability and you have the authority to go ahead and to move and to touch those things and to say this is the way it's going to be and it'll be that way. So she would cry out to that judge. But again, I want us to look. I want us to see that man's character because the Bible said that he wouldn't hear her. He could care less about what the right thing was to do in the situation. He could care less that she was a widow, that she had no one uh, with her, that she didn't have a son to take care of. I mean, she didn't have somebody to go all to Old Testament on it and to say, I'm going to be an avenger of blood. I'm going to go and I'm going to take care of the situation. She had nobody else to cry out to. She had nobody else to save her. She had nobody else to help her. So she went to this man who was in a position to do this thing. She went to this man whose job and whose responsibility it was to do this kind of thing. Have you ever went to somebody and it's been their job to take care of things? It's been their job to step up and to do things. And, and you've went to them and you've had to cry to them. And they just wouldn't do their job. Anybody? I, I've had it happen. I've had, I've had it happen in church stuff I went with some people, some high up people, nobody that I'm going to mention today. But I mean, you, you approach people and you say, hey, you say, I need you to do this. I did my part. Now I want you to do your job. I want you to do the thing that you said you would do. And you said if I would meet this point and if I would meet this mark and if I would pass this test and if I would jump through this hoop, that you would do this thing. And now I expect you to do it. But the person's a jerk. They said, man, I mean, pounded their chest. The person's a jerk. Man, I've got the love of God in me. But they don't have a fear of the Lord. They don't care what's right or what's wrong. Otherwise, they would see that they were accountable. This judge was a man that was accountable. He was a man that was put in a position where he was supposed to step up. And he was supposed to do the right thing. And he was supposed to take care of business. But he could care less. But the woman here that we see, who's the, who's the real character in the story? She's the protagonist and the one that keeps it going. This woman here, this little widow woman, the Bible tells you that she just didn't go to him once and said, I need you to avenge me of my adversary. I need you to do this thing that I can't do myself. I need you to step up and stand up for me to do this impossible thing. I need this done in my life. I have a problem and I have a situation and I have a circumstance. And if you don't step in the gap for me and to do this, it ain't going to be done. How many of y'all have went through your life and you had a situation in your life where you needed God to move on something? Where if God didn't step up because the doctors would say there's nothing that we can do. Or your friends would say there's nothing that we can do. People would pass you up and they would pass you by. And you would say, but if God could just intervene, hallelujah. You know, so many times we see in our lives that you pray a prayer and immediately something doesn't always just happen, Right? We read in the book of Daniel about how he had went on a fast and how he had prayed. We talked about that just the other week. Sometimes prayer just isn't enough. The disciples, they went up and they were casting devils out of people on the right hand. And they were casting out devils out of people on the left hand. They were going into this town over here and that town back there and that town over yonder. And they're knocking devils out of people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But they came to one individual and they prayed and they said all the right things and they just believed ever been as much as they ever had and, and nothing happened. So they could pull over another disciple. They pull over another disciple. I mean, they were having a Holy Ghost camp meeting, prayer meeting, revival, praying over this demonized person. But the devil wouldn't come out of them. And they asked Jesus, they said, what's wrong? What's the problem? He said, this kind doesn't come out by prayer and fasting. Amen. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the things that you want, sometimes 
sometimes the things that you need, sometimes the things that God has set up for you, they're not easy, are they? But you've got to give a little bit more for that. Again, the, the moral to this parable that's being told here is that we always ought to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Amen. Can somebody say, don't give up? This widow woman, she came to this judge time and time again, saying, would you please avenge me of my adversary? Because the Bible says in verse 4, and he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. He could care less about God. He could care less what was the right thing to do. He could care less what his oath was when he took office. He could care less what his responsibilities as a judge was. He could care less what the moral thing was to do. He could care less what karma had to say about it. He could care less about reaping and sowing. He could care less about the, the brokenness in this woman's eyes and the destitute that she was in. He could care less about having compassion on this person who had nobody in her life that could have compassion on her. Nobody in her life that could help her the way that he could. He could care less about it. It seemed like an impossible situation, didn't it? It seemed like she was talking to a wall, didn't it? But with a persistence and with a fire in her heart that this thing needs to get done. Somebody needs to get up and do this thing. I need this thing done. And there's nobody else that can do it but this judge. So if I keep asking, and if I keep asking, and if I keep asking, even though my friends tell me that there's no way, even though people tell me that I could just should just shut up, doesn't it remind you of blind Bartimaeus a little bit? Because blind Bartimaeus, he was out there in the street when Jesus was passing by. His friends knew what he had in mind. They told him, they said, you don't need to be bothered. Jesus, Jesus has more important things to do. Jesus has more important people to see. Jesus has more stuff going on in his life where he can't trouble himself with you, Bartimaeus. There were people that surrounded Jesus, people that would flock after Jesus, people that would get up and they would run to Jesus. They would see him coming and they would run and meet him down the road and throw themselves at his feet. He was engulfed in a small sea of people as he went through the town. They were, I mean, if you have that many people, they just get loud. And then they were out there and they were loud and they were boisterous. They were excited about Jesus. He's walking through the crowd of the people. He's got the disciples all around him. He's got his entourage, so to say, around him. The Pharisees and people are gnashing their teeth and their guts are ground all to pieces because they see him going through. It's a big scene. The Roman guards are standing by wondering if there's going to be some kind of a riot or something because there's so many people in one place. All kinds of stuff is going on. There's chaos in the streets. It's pandemonium. You've got people who and hollering like it's some kind of a festival or something because Jesus came to town and he brought the party with him, so it would seem. But this man, Bartimaeus, sat there and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And nothing happened, right? I mean, that's what the Bible tells you. The Bible tells you that he said that and Jesus didn't come there the first time that he said it. It's Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He continually began to cry. Jesus had so many things going on, so many people that were loud around him. Maybe he couldn't hear the man at that time. Maybe he wasn't close enough to get by, but he persisted to cry. His friends came and they told him, you need to shut up. I know that your faith says that Jesus is going to hear you. I know that your faith says that Jesus is going to touch you. I know that your faith says that Jesus is going to heal you, but your faith is wrong, Bartimaeus. You need to shut up. God didn't send Jesus to this town to touch you. God doesn't care what's going on in your life. And yet he persisted to cry, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, Bartimaeus, you've already hollered three times. 
Can't you hear the people in this widow's life saying the same thing? If she had people in her life, if she had friends in her life, if she had neighbors in her life, there goes that widow. What audacity that she must have to aggravate and to disturb and to have so many things to do. He has so many cases to try. He's got a life to live. Surely he has more important things to do than to hear the cry of that little insignificant widow. The Bible doesn't say that oh, she was an important person or he would have let her ride in and he would have did something for her, right? I mean, if it, if it was the governor that needed something done, maybe something would have happened. But this is a woman, a little widow woman, somebody that the world would look at and they would say they're going to be overlooked, just like Bartimaeus. The Bible tells you that he began to cry again and again, and he began to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they just told him, would you just sit down? Would you just be quiet? Jesus isn't here for you. God's not going to hear you. God's not going to move on you. If he hears you, his answer is just probably might as well going to be no. God wouldn't have left you in this situation as long as you've been in this situation if he was going to touch you. Amen? But he persisted to cry. And this widow persisted to come to this judge and persisted to cry. And to say, have mercy on me. I have a need and it's just not being met. When we look into the book of Daniel and we begin to read about it, he went on a 21-day fast. He was praying and he was fasting. And do you know what? He didn't hear back from God on the first day. And he didn't hear back from God on the second day. And time would persist to go by, but he never gave up. He kept praying, and he kept fasting. Man, if anybody knew about that, they would say, man, that Daniel, I know that God's worked for him before, but he must really be an idiot. Because he's just went on and on, and he hasn't heard from God. He hasn't seen his miracle yet. Why, well, it's, well, it's, uh, it's been two weeks, 14 days it went by, and he hasn't heard from God. Day after day. you, Daniel. They would begin, the devil would come and he would get in his ear and say, God's not going to answer you. It's just like Job in the Old Testament. These people that went to accuse him, Satan himself was in the midst working. The Bible says that the devil himself, it says that a spirit, a thing went by him and he couldn't discern its face, but it made the hairs on his arms stand on end. The devil came along and it worked through Bartimaeus' friends. The devil just ought to give up. You just ought to give up. Quit hanging on. You just ought to let go. You just ought to face it. Your enemies got by with it, little widow woman, because you're just a little widow, and there ain't anybody that can do anything for you, and this judge ain't going to do anything for you anyway. You might as well talk to the wall. Amen? You might as well quit. But she persisted, and Bartimaeus persisted, and Daniel persisted. On the 21st day of his fast, the Bible says that an angel of the Lord came down to him and said to him, Daniel, God heard you the first time that you prayed, but the devil, all he could do was hold up the answer. The only thing he could do was to slow it down and to hold it back. But you were faithful, and God heard you, and God saw you. And when you kept fighting, I kept fighting, hallelujah, for you. When you continue to stand for God and meet God, hallelujah, he's going to stand for you. There's people that you'll do your part, amen, in this life, and they won't do theirs. Is that right? Come on. Amen. That's why you don't pay people before they do a job, right? Because they won't do the job, amen. I mean, a lot of times, right? They'll skip town. They'll take the money and they will run. They won't do that. They'll go into a vow with you. They'll go into a covenant with you. They'll say, man, you can trust me. You can hold on. And you'll do your part. And you'll find, man, they, they ran. They left town. All there is is dust behind. The Bible says when you draw nigh to God, when you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. If, if you fight and if you hang on and if you keep praying and if you keep faithful, hallelujah, God will keep standing and fight for you. There's an instance in the Old Testament where we begin to read about a king that a prophet had came to him and he said, King, 
you're going to die. Hey, thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. So he turned his face to a wall and he, he began to remind God of some things and he began to pray. And as that prophet was walking, as the prophet was getting out of there, just as, just as he had left the palace, just as he was about to hit the road and go into the next town, God Almighty spoke to him and stopped him and he said, you turn around and you tell him, I changed my mind. Because he persisted. Because he kept asking. How ask and you shall receive. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Amen. Hallelujah. So you have to keep asking sometimes. Is that right? This woman was persistent. How many times do you go and you knock on a door and you go like that? If you really needed in that door, you would stay and you would knock, and you would knock, and you would knock. There's been times and there's been situations where I've had to get a hold of somebody on the phone. We all know what that's like. And you don't just ring their phone once, but every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, you're back there, you're ringing that phone. Well, they're on another line. Well, they can't talk to you right now. Well, they went on lunch, they'll be back in an hour. But if you really need to get a hold of that person, if something really needs to be done and something really needs to happen, you're going to persist and you're going to keep calling them. Bartimaeus had such a need in his life, hallelujah, that nobody could answer it and nobody could meet it. But that man, Jesus Christ, hallelujah. And he believed that God had sent him there for a purpose. And he believed that God was going to heal him. And it didn't matter what his friends said. And it didn't matter if his family said, Bartimaeus, you're crazy. He just kept on, kept on keeping on. And he did what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Thus saith the Lord. And not what men said. The Bible says, let God's word be true and every man a liar. We can speak doubt over the things that we're praying for and we can poison the water. You know that? Hallelujah. If you're believing for a miracle, don't get up and talk against it. If you're believing for a miracle, don't get up and say, well, the what is or the I don't know. So, uh, Bartimaeus didn't do that. Bartimaeus continually cried out and this widow woman cried out too. The Bible says and he would not, let me just read the whole thing. That there was a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, in his heart of hearts, this is what he thought. Though I fear not God nor regard man. He didn't care who anybody was, did he? He didn't care about anything but himself. We come to find out, right? It said, yet because this widow troubled me, even though I could care less, because she's aggravating me, because she won't quit asking, because she won't keep calling to my house, because she won't keep beating on my door. Because she won't quit sending me letters about it. Because she just won't let up. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Amen. Hallelujah. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. And, he, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Amen. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Do we have the faith that that woman had? Do we have the faith that that woman had where she wouldn't let up, where she wouldn't let go, where she just kept praying? Amen. The Lord put a calling on my heart to preach when I was seven years old, spoke to me, told me to preach and I ran. Had the, had, had the calling to pastor for years and years and years and years. So you hit a wall. And do you know what people would ask over the years? Every time they would see my mom out somewhere, certain people, they would say, is Ben still out preaching? Has Ben let go? Is he still out preaching? Is he just keep, is he still praying and has he not fainted? Amen. Is he still hanging on? Is he still hanging on to the promises that God Almighty spoke over his life and that he knows that even though there could be some jerk back there, because there always is, right? There's usually a row of them that says, I don't believe it. 
I don't think that's the way that it is. I don't think God's going to do those things. Because if God was going to do that, it would have happened a long time ago. If God was going to do that, then I would have saw it unfolding. If God was going to do that, then why didn't he tell me? Why didn't he tell Ben what he was going to Why doesn't he just prove it to everybody and go ahead? But yet, Ben keeps hanging on to it. He's not living in reality. But I've had it asked over and over again. Hearing about it, she'd say, hey, I saw so-and-so today. And they said, is Ben still preaching? Over the years, on and on, went ahead and pastored a church, tiny little church, storefront church in Rockwood. Nobody could find it. Nobody came. We had it open for a year. We had three church services a week. We had a watch night service. I think we had two revivals uh, during then. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Not nearly what we did last year here at this church. Praise the Lord. I'm excited. But we, we did what we could do back then at the time. And uh, we had to close the doors. I've got up and I've preached when people haven't been in the church. I've got up and preached when nobody would show up. You have to be faithful even when things aren't glorious. This woman continued to go to the judge even when things didn't look like they were ever going to get off the ground. This woman had to keep on even when things weren't flying high. I've had people ask about this church, how many people go to that church. They think we're some kind of a great big church because we, we sponsored this school and we sponsored that school and we sponsored that school. And we had singings and we had singing groups in and we had revivals coming in. And there's some churches that never even have a revival. And there's some churches that never even have a singing. And there's some churches that never even do anything outside their door. God bless all of them that do. Hallelujah. But we have to keep on keeping on. I'm excited about God here today. I'm excited about the things that God's doing. I'm excited about what all he's going to do here in this church. And we need to hang on. And we need to hold on. And we need to press on. And we need to keep pressing on. I'm thankful for him here this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for God. We need to hold on. Hallelujah. Is that right? This woman, she came. And she wouldn't let go. You know, I think about Peter right there. Because Peter had told Jesus before the crucifixion, before that happened, when he said, you know, there's going to be people, there's going to be somebody that's going to be, that's going to betray me. And Peter looked him square in the eye and he said, Lord, he said, not me. He said, I would die for you. Well, he was holding on, wasn't he? But Jesus looked right back at him and he said, before the cock crows thrice, you're going to let go. You're not going to be as faithful as you say you are to me. You're not going to hold on to me the way that you said that you hold on to me. Thomas, a man that had walked with Jesus after the resurrection, he said, I won't believe it. Everything that he's preached, everything that he's taught, all the miracles that they saw him do. The Bible says that it was put in, in the document, all the miracles that Jesus did in his life. All the books in the world could not hold them. It was, it was exquisitely more than we read about in the Bible. Every day something was happening. Every day something was going on. Things so miraculous but Thomas, seeing all of this, being around this man in the, in the heat of his ministry, in his, the years of his ministry, for three solid years, seeing him go into the towns with huge multitudes surrounding him. And the Bible saying again and again, and he healed them all. And he healed them, everyone. Man, he was devout. Man, he was structured in Jesus. Man, he was holding on. But the second something went away that he couldn't understand, why is this going on, God? Why am I not getting the results that I want to get? It's the same thing, isn't it? That we need to keep praying even when things look like, wait a second, I'm not there yet. Amen? But Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I can feel the sign. Unless I can feel his nail-pierced hands. 
The Bible says that Jesus, he came and that he appeared for them. He appeared to them. And the Bible says that he confronted him. And he said, do you really want to fill my wounded side? Do you really want to fill my nail piercing? Is that what it's going to take? Because he said to him, he said, Thomas, let me tell you something. He said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Hallelujah. That's what faith really is, isn't it? Faith is when you believe it, when you haven't touched his nail pierced hands, when you haven't touched his wounded side. It's that you believe that God's going to do a miracle for you when you don't see it happening. It's that you believe God's going to do something when you're a blind Bartimaeus and you're sitting there on the side of the street and everybody that's supposed to be your friend and everybody that's supposed to encourage you and everybody that's supposed to be on your side is saying, God's not going to hear your cries for help. God's not going to hear your prayers. God's not going to move this mountain out of your way. But blind Bartimaeus, in spite of and all the contradiction, he believed it anyway. We as a church and we as Christians need to pray. Gail Shelby had a, a, had a slogan, a, a moniker, a mantra, whatever you want to call it, that in her life, in her last several years of her life, as people, as Christians, as different churches would come together and they would pray, God heal Gail Shelby. Her life continued to hang on by a thread as she would lose more of life in her lung, as, it, as it, the capacity for her lung to work would go down and down and down and down and down. I visited her in the ICU at, uh, at Tennessee Medical Center before I wrote a song about her. And Mike Shelby, her husband, he was he was there faithfully standing by her there in that darkened room when she was there resting. And he told me, he said, Ben, he said, if God doesn't heal her, he said, she's going to die. Let me tell you the reality about this. Gail Shelby has a new body. Gail Shelby... Uh, Hallelujah. Is it gasping for breath? Gil Shelby uh, isn't sick anymore. Gil Shelby doesn't have to worry about pneumonia plaguing her body and she just can't get rid of it. But God has touched her in such a way. She stepped out of this life and a life made mortal. Amen. And she had the moniker that people, if they would just believe. Amen. It was just one word. Believe. Hallelujah. And people would come together and would join together and would pray and would cry out hallelujah. I know that there's reasons and circumstances that we don't understand why everything happens in this life, but that doesn't mean that we need to let go. That doesn't mean that we need to drop it. That doesn't mean that we need to give up, but we need to get to keep holding on and we need to keep pressing on and we need to keep believing. Amen. I'm thankful for him here today. We need to believe. Thomas is, and when they were there, when Jesus came, the Bible says that he did a multitude of miracles there in the midst of those disciples, in the midst of those men. There were people that had been converted, hallelujah, to Christianity. We were watching that movie a while back, Quo Vads me Victoria, where how Nero had came along and how these people that were Christians, how he persecuted them, how he said, you're going to turn or you're going to burn. It was kind of Bible backwards, wasn't it? They would get them and they would bind them and they would burn their bodies. He would play his lyre as they lit his rose garden at night. As Rome was burning, he began to orchestrate music to it. He would feed them to the lions and fierce animals. He would have them run through with spears and run through with swords. The, man, the man's one of history's greatest psychotics uh, that there was. He would get up narcissistic as all can be. He would get up and he would put on plays in his own honor and he would be the star of them. He would get up, he was the rock star of all kings. Would get up and he would play his music and then would demand that people applauded and that people loved him and tried to live and tried to flaunt his celebrity and tried to mow down the people of God, but they wouldn't give up and they wouldn't bow down and they wouldn't let go, but they just kept holding on. Hallelujah. Peter, he turned around when he could have left the place, but he came back to know that he was going to suffer a death. Amen. The apostle Paul went to a place where he knew that he was going to die. Jesus Christ went to a place where he knew that he was going to die because even in the face of danger and even in the face of adversity, 
did. They kept hanging on and they didn't let go. The Bible says, hallelujah, that blessed are those that have endured on. That's the way we need to be as Christians is we need to be consistent and we need to hang on. I've read in the word of God where it begins to talk about the faithful, the faith chapter. It talks about how people have slain giants and they've done these great things in the name of the Lord. But when you read the rest of that chapter, you begin to see that there's people who had lived in caves and who had suffered and who had struggled. But let me tell you what God was with them. Hallelujah. God heard their prayers and you need to be faithful. The Bible says in the Lord that he's going to take up the fight for us. David said that I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed crying out for bread. God's going to be there when you call out to him and he will avenge you. The Bible says speedily that we're supposed to be like this woman and we're supposed to come and we're supposed to come again and to come again and to come again and to come again. Hallelujah. Sometimes the things that make our prayers the most effective, and we could really talk about this and go on a long time because there's a lot of elements to it. But one of the things that makes our prayers effective is the consistency of them. It's that we're consistent. Inconsistency isn't going to get us anywhere, is it? Because the Bible tells us, it says that if you ask, hallelujah, that you shall receive, but it begins to talk about somebody else. It says that we're supposed to know it in our hearts and our minds. It says, but there's somebody, hallelujah, that's double-minded out there. There, that they're like the sea, that they foam in and that they foam back, and that they go this way and that they go that way. And it says God isn't even going to hear a person's prayers like that. God isn't even going to answer a person's prayers like that. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's what the New Testament says. We have to be consistent. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us clearly that inconsistency will keep you from getting that thing done. And Bartimaeus would have just turned back and he would have said, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth having. I'm just going to drop the ball. Just forget about it right now. He would have lost his blessing. But because he kept hanging on, the man that was at the pool of Bethesda, he had laid there for a year, for a long time. He just kept coming back to that pool. How desperate did that situation seem? Because when Jesus came to him and he said, well, what are you doing here? He said, you know, I would get in this pool if there was somebody just to help me and to put me in. But every time that I start to get close, every time that the water's troubled by an angel, where I can get my healing, where I can get my blessing, somebody else, they knew that was the place to be. Somebody else gets up and they run ahead of me and they get in that water and they take that you to know that he kept coming back. Now, I bet, and I just bet, because you know how people are, that there was somebody that went there for their blessing at one point in time. They might have went back for a few days. They might have went back for a week. There might have been somebody that was a little more hardcore than that. They might have, they might have stuck with it for a month. They might have said, man, I need this blessing from God. I need this thing. I need a healing in my life. But people kept running on ahead of them. People kept pushing through ahead of them. And they got up and they left. This man was healed because he kept hanging on. Because he was persistent. Because he wouldn't let go. The Bible gives this woman as a clear illustration that if we keep hanging on, hallelujah, that, and don't faint, that God's going to hear us. Jesus said, just like that judge, I want you to know this, just like that judge, this, this judge who can care less about God, who can care less about men, who can care less about anybody, but the only person that we see that affected him is because this is happening to me because this woman won't leave me alone. And the only thing that affected him was that he was being aggravated because he couldn't sleep at night because of this woman calling him on the phone, because of this woman hollering from out his window, because she was a terror by day and a terror by night to him. That he said, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to do this thing. Or Jesus said, how much more will God do that for you? But for his very elect, he said, I'll tell you this more. He said, God will answer your prayer speedily. Amen. He won't take his time about it. He won't take too long about it. But God will get on that thing and he'll do that. If you're faithful and if you pray and if you ask. There have been pastors who pastored church here before. Church under different names, different preachers over the years. 
all kinds of different circumstances and situations. And I would hear that, man, it was going good. And some people were happy, but maybe it wasn't going the way they wanted it to. Because in spite of the fact that some people liked them, and I'm talking about, about people running people off and everything, in spite of the fact that some people liked that individual, they got up and left. I guess they had a vision and they just didn't see that vision come true. A lot of times what keeps us from the place that God wants us from is that we're not hanging on long enough. That we're not holding on long enough. We've been preaching, man, the rapture is going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back. The rapture is going to happen. There have been people who have preached that and they've died preaching that and they've died believing that. Still hasn't happened, hasn't it? But it's going to happen and you need to hang on. Jesus said no man knows the hour. Hallelujah. If we knew when it was going to happen, you'd wait till the last minute. All the parables that Jesus talked about, wait till the last minute. Say, man, I can just get my life right with God. Hallelujah. The Word of God tells us that we're not promised tomorrow. Hallelujah. Then we got to get it right here today. And we got to keep hanging on because one day He's coming back. And if He came back yesterday, I was ready yesterday. If He came back the day before yesterday, I was ready yesterday, that day. And I'm ready today. And I'm going to be ready tomorrow because. I've been hanging on for a long time and I've gone too far to look back and I'm going to keep on hanging on hallelujah to the promises of God give the Lord a hand clap I want everybody to bow your heads and to close your eyes where you're sitting maybe there's something that you need in your life Maybe there's something that you need for God to take you to a place or to do a thing. And I want you to pray for that. But I just don't want that to end here because that's not really where it ends, is it? But the Bible tells us to be consistent and to be persistent. Amen. And to keep on praying. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that every individual that's here today, that you would continue to do something in their lives, that you would move us, Lord. Even when the storm would rage against us, when it looks like we're not going to see the sunny skies or the clear skies or the promises of God or the, or the things fulfilled, God, Father, that we're believing for. We pray, God, that we would stand strong in faith because that's where the test is, God. It's not when we get everything right away. It's not when we see everything happening right away, God, Father. But we pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in the hard times, that we would hang on, Lord, Father, even when it feels like we're talking to a wall, even when the world would stand by and say, does your God even hear your prayers? We know, God, that you heard them the moment that we prayed them. We know, God, Father, that you're anxious to answer them and that you're going to answer them speedily. If we just keep hanging on, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would move in this church, that you would move in the singings, that you would move in the revivals, that you would move in the services, Lord, that you would move in our finances, that you would move in our health, Lord, Father, that you would move, Lord, Father, in, in, in the, the structural wealth of our souls. Take us to a brighter and a closer place with you. We pray, God, Father, that you would work in every aspect of our lives, Lord, from the job to the church, Lord, Father, to the ball games or wherever we are or whatever we do, that you would be with us, that you would cause us to do more things that uplift and that edify you. We pray, God, that you would just be glorified in everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, hallelujah, that we would have the mind of Christ and Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Hallelujah, we ask it. By faith, we stand on it. We believe it. And we're not going to keep asking. And we're not going to quit praying until, Lord, Father, you move on these things. Because we know that you're faithful. Hallelujah. And if we be faithful to ask, and if we keep asking, and if we be faithful to stand, that one day there's an answer coming down that road. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we give you all the praise and glory and honor. Amen. I don't remember if next Sunday morning is the first Sunday of February, is it? Okay, if, if it is, we've got a real good singing group coming down. If not, then it'll be the, the Sunday morning after. We have Tim Chastain and eight days after. Really looking forward to having them down. That will be the first Sunday morning of February. We've got another singing group coming in late February uh, down to the church. I think the 21st, 26th, something like that. Uh, it's, it's on Facebook. You can look it up. The Pruitt family will be here on that Sunday morning. Looking forward to having them. They're going to be here.
here during our homecoming singing, uh, all kinds of things going on in March and April. Tell people about it. We will be having Saturday night service every Saturday of the month of March, every Saturday of the month of April. Churches used to do that, and then they just got lazy about it. They just they stopped hanging on is what they really stopped doing, amen, like the message today. They just let go, and they just gave up. People said, man, people aren't coming to our Sunday services in the morning as much because of our Saturday night services, so we're just going to do less. And nowadays, people are saying people aren't coming to our Sunday evening services as much, so we're just going to do less there. And then, man, the, the Wednesday night services, that's such a drag. It's in the middle of the week, so we're just going to do less of that. I don't believe that we're going to get the things that we want from God by doing less. Here in the Bible, it clearly, emphatically illustrates to us that this woman didn't get the thing that she wanted by going to this judge less. This woman didn't get the things that she wanted in her life by showing up less, but by doing more. She began to write letters. She began to send word through the grapevine. She went herself to his house and would holler out to him and say, would you help me? He would be walking down the street and here would come this woman aggravating him, uh, saying, I need you to avenge me of my enemy. I need you to do these things inappropriate as it might have seemed unrelenting as it might have seemed wacko that he may have thought she was he went ahead and did it anyway hallelujah because she kept hanging on shake your hand and be friendly service tonight at 6pm service Wednesday night at 7pm